Yes. Thanks. Uh, thanks a lot for uh, the opportunity, giving the opportunity to, to talk. This is work which has been going on. Is there anything to point? Oh, this. Okay, perfect. Nice. This is work which has been going on uh, in Saclay for the past year in collaboration with these guys. Uh, those guys already have uh, postdocs. This guy is still in the market. Uh, those guys are around here. Anthony is here. Uh, Sean is not. Uh, Nate is uh, here and Sean is here. So, and Nick is here. So, uh, this is some. Um, so, this is the investigation about some object uh, in string theory, which we discovered and we think it's quite. Uh, quite amazing. Um, let me go back uh, one uh, a bit of time, uh, many years ago. Uh, people counted black hole microstates. We know in string theory you can count black hole microstates. We do we do a lot of counting in microscopic reg regime of, of parameters. You count at zero gravity, you get the black hole entropy by counting brains and strings. Uh, and then uh, the question is, what's happening when I go to finite gravity? For a long time, people believed that you know when you go to finite gravity, you just uh, you just um, you know. The objects become smaller, the black hole horizon becomes bigger, uh, the black hole horizon at some point becomes bigger than the object, and you get a standard black hole. This, was, this has been the standard lore. Uh, recently, there's a lot of work in this, in this after following Chen Maldas and Awitan, and some people in the audience, and you know, some talks were about, were about this. However, um, over the past you know, 20 years, our work has been showing that, uh, no, some of these microstates, they have no intention to get a horizon, Rather, they become horizon solutions which look like a black hole, quack like a black hole, but don't have a horizon, but instead have a smooth, have a smooth region. And the big hope of our program, the big hope of our work over all these 20 years has been that we'll be able to take all the black hole microstates here, all the stromage of alpha states here, and track them one to one, each and every one of them, into something like this and prove that this is the correct picture for black hole. This has been the big hope. However, in the 20 years of work, uh, Nick has reviewed most of, this, uh, most of these results. Again, we were able to build a huge amount of solutions, bubbling solutions, the largest class of solutions known to Einstein's equations ever known to mankind, you know, the biggest, fattest families of solution ever built. We really have a lot of success, but if you count, if you count the entropy, and many of those things have features of typical microstates, for example, the mass gap you get from the solutions we have is, is, is exactly the one you expect for the typical black hole microstates. However, however, if you look at if you look at the entropy of the things we have built, this is the entropy. It goes like q1, q5 to the one half times qp to the one quarter, and it's smaller than the black hole entropy. It's smaller than the black hole entropy. Moreover, if you ask what is the is there a direct link between these microstates and the ones which count the black hole microstates, the problem is um, the, the link with the D25 states is known for a very few solutions. It's very complicated to build. And you need essentially Elvish medicine. You need like, you know, horrible precision holography. They're like, you know, maybe three people on the, on the planet who can do it. Okay, maybe not three, but, you know, maybe five. And, you know, maybe two of them, two or three of them are in this room. It's really hard. You really have to compute, you know, three point functions and you have to compute them in the CFT. And it's, it's a very painful process. We don't have a good one to one map between D1, D5, Stromanger, Vapa states, for example, and solutions. Um, moreover, if you look at the modes which give you the black hole entropy of the D1 and D5 system, you have D1 brains, you have D5 brains. There are modes which have which are bifundamentals with one leg on one, one, one leg on the other one. The momentum quantization of these modes is units of one over n1 n5. Uh, so those are fractionated modes, and those are very hard to get in supergravity. So we don't even have a way to get a good handle of the modes on the modes which give you the strong of alpha entropy. Now you can say, wait. So the painful reality has been that we have not been able to track successfully D1 and D5 states from the zero gravity solution to the, to, the, to the finite gravity regime where the black hole exists. And the question is, 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 is this a fundamental problem or a technical limitation? We can only build some superstrata. They're very hard to build even, even when they're supersymmetric with some particular basis. Maybe it's a technical problem. Maybe if we just have a, a, a better techni technology, we're, we're, we're able to build more general solutions. Um, however, uh, it's, it's, very hard to, it's, it's very hard to understand that. Maybe we have some other class of solutions for which we don't have a good CFT dual, which are called bubbling solutions. We don't know how to build superstrata on them. Maybe once you build the more, more generic solutions, you'll be able to find all the entropy. We don't know. This is just, you know, speculation. And, you know, we've been stuck on this for, you know, a long time. We've been trying to get all the black hole microstates from one regime to the other one. And it, it has been very hard. So since I'm a Romanian, um, there's a Romanian proverb, you know, don't pray to the saint who doesn't help you. You know, some things, you know, you can try, but at some point, you know, you, don't, you, you have to change a bit approaches. And instead of looking at the D1, D5 system, which is, again, the good old, the working course of all these things, you can look at it in a T-dual frame. The black hole is still there. You know, the black holes don't change when you do a T-duality or, or an S-duality. You can look at the D2, D4 system, or you can look at an F1 and S5 system in type 1A. Now, 
As there, we can also do a strom of counting. This has been shown by Dagra Verlinde and Verlinde long, long time ago. What's happening is the following. You have N, you have N five and five five brains. And when you bring one fundamental string inside, the fundamental string breaks into N five little strings, which are all independent momentum carriers. The easiest way to see is if you uplift this to M theory. In M theory, the, the NS fibrins become some M fibrins, which are here in blue at various locations on the M theory circle. And if you bring an M2 brain, uh, an F1 string, an F1 string becomes an M2 brain, which is wrapping the M theory circle. So this is, for example, one M2 brain, this, 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 and this. But you see that because you have this NS fives, this M2 brain has actually broken into basically three strips this one, this one, and this one. So now instead of having one momentum carrier from one fundamental string, you actually have three momentum carriers. And this happens generically when you have N5 NS5 brains and N1 uh, F1 strings in type 1A. Uh, in type 2A, you can, actually, um, you can actually fractionate all of the strings and you end up getting N1 times N5 independent oscillators, independent momentum carriers. So again, all of these M2 brain strips become momentum carriers. This is the momentum direction. You can put momentum on all of them and you can get, you can get the black hole entropy. It's very hard to, it's, it's very easy to calculate. Um, those, each, each and every one of those M2 strips lives inside the torus. So there are basically four bosonic degrees of freedom. There are some fermionic partners and when you count the entropy, you find exactly the black hole entropy. You know, it's usually the bosonic, the number of bosonic uh, degrees of freedom plus fermionic degrees of freedom divided by two. So that's four plus two divided by six in the Cardi formula. So you get exactly the black hole entropy, but not by doing stroman jovafa D1, D5 by fundamentals, rather by actually breaking up the F1s into little strings on the NS5 brain. And this is the story again in the in, in the F1 and S5 story. In the D2D4, there's a similar story. Um, they look exactly the same. Um, so here again, we have these M2 strips, and the momentum goes along these directions. The fractionation is a bit different. Normally, in the D1 D5 system, you fractionate the, the, the momentum. The momentum becomes quantized in units of one over N1 and M5. So the momentum quanta become very light. Here it's actually the F1s which become very light. The F1s break up, you, you, have, you have an F1 which has, a, which has a alpha prime tension, it becomes broken into N5 little strings. So the tension of the F1 becomes down by a factor of N5. So the fractionation happens in a different beast. It happens at the level of the F1s. It's, 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 it's a different type, type of fractionation. And this is again the zero coupling picture. The question is, can we track this? Can we go from the zero coupling picture, again, from the zero gravity picture, which where things look like this, into the regime of parameters where supergravity is valid and the black hole exists? And the point is to remember at finite coupling, what's happening is that you have these M2 brains, I'm giving here a very simple, I'm, I'm, I'm omitting the Y direction, which are actually ending on the M5 brains. But we know very well uh, from some good old work by Kalan and Maldacena, that when you have a D1 brain ending on a D3 brain, the D1 brain pulls the D3 brain into a spike. So you basically get a spike on the D3 brain word volume, which is called the Kalan Maldacena spike. And in a similar fashion, you can show that the M2 brains actually pull on the M5. So the M5 actually get pulled into this direction and they get pulled here and they get pulled here and you get some, some mixed solution which has both M5 and M2 and you know some other dipolar M5 and some dipolar M2 which are basically taking care of this, which are basically constructing, which are used to construct this, this particular configuration. But this is actually what's happening. The M2 brain pulls on the M5s and deforms their, uh, their word volume except that you don't have a spike because a spike happens when object is co-dimension one, uh, is, is, has the full co-dimension. Here actually you have this M2, M5, but everything is along the Y direction, the momentum direction. So you basically have um, a furrow. You basically have, um, you, you, you basically have like, have, have like a valley on which again, so here, for example, if you just take this, this looks like this. You really have, you, you have the whole Y direction and then you can actually put some momentum waves on top of the surface. And you know, this is actually how the microstate is going to look like when you take this brain-brain interaction into account. Um, and if you zoom in on one of these things, you can zoom in and what you can find is that even if naively I have three charges, I have you know, F1 and S5 and P or I have M2 and 5 and P. So I have the three charges of the black hole. If I look locally, locally I see the three charges of the black hole, which are the ones here. But I see some extra charges. For example, those two guys, I can see them even in the two charge system. They are basically some M2 brain, but not in the direction X11 and Y, which is my original direction, but in this X1, X11. So they are basically correspond to some tilt. So the M2 charge, you don't have M2s only going like this. You also have some M2s going like this at this location and some M2s going like this at its other location. So you have extra charges. You have again, three 
supersymmetric charges, and then you have extra types of charges. And if you zoom in locally on this object, what you find is that when you zoom in on this object, the supersymmetry is enhanced. The D1, D5 system or the F1 and S5 system has four supersymmetries. The black hole has four supersymmetries. But when you zoom in near this beast and you look at one particular region of this thing, even if you have nine charges, one, two, three, nine, the supersymmetry locally is actually enhanced to 16 supersymmetries. But what's happening is that you have 16 supersymmetries here, 16 here, but they're not the same. 16 here, but they're not the same. 16 here, 16 here, 16 everywhere locally, but globally only four of them are preserved. That's what's happening when you zoom in on this, on this, on this, uh, on the superstratum, on, on this, on, on this, on, on this object. And this has been the smoking gun of horizonless solutions. Again, I'm giving you some history, um, starting from 2006 when Nick and I had these bubbling solutions, the first ever smooth solutions which replaced the black hole and you know have the same charge as the black hole with the horizon, the first, the, the first possible solutions. Uh, we had them and then people realized, VJ and, um, and, and collaborators realized that if you go to all the centers, the centers actually, they correspond to multi-center flux to the six brains. And again, each and every one of them has 16 supersymmetries, but only four are preserved globally. If you look at a more complicated solution, which, which involves super tubes, that's the one we had back in 2010. Again, it depends on function of one variable. If you zoom in near the location of the brains, if the zoom in has 16 supersymmetries, the solution is smooth and doesn't have a horizon. If the zoom in has less supersymmetries, the solution is not smooth. So there seems to be a dictionary in this example, again, between local 16 supersymmetries and smoothness. Same for the superstratum. When we connected the superstratum back with uh, Masaki and Jan Debur and Nick in 2011, we used exactly the same logic. We said there should be an object which has locally 16 supersymmetries, which differ as you go along. They are different 16 at every location. So locally they are different. Only four are preserved globally. And then when we built the bloody object in Habemos in 2015, we found that indeed using these parameters, you end up getting a smooth solution. So this logic has been our guiding light over the past you know, many, many years. When you have a brain configuration of, of 16 supercharges locally, then you basically get a smooth horizon solution. This seems to be this seems to be the game again in all the in all the examples which are known. So I expect that this that, that I expect that this that this configuration is also going to give us a smooth a smooth solution. Now, what's the entropy of the super maze? To see the entropy, you have to remember that uh, again you have this object. I'm, I'm, I'm doing here in a, in a D four D two because it's a bit simpler, and you put a momentum along the y along the uh, along the y direction. If you look at the solutions which, where the momentum is carried by bosonic degrees of freedom, which are happening fully inside the torus, so there's nothing happening in the transverse space. So in the transverse space, you have, this is a black hole in five dimensions, so it's a point in R4. If I just look at the symmetry of the solution, I have a point in the R4, in the R4, uh, and, you know, and I have time. So the solution, all this garbage happens inside the internal directions. It happens inside the torus. In the space time, everything is nice and spherically symmetric and beautiful. So you have perfect spherical symmetry, the same SO4 symmetry as the black hole in the space time. But on the torus, you have basically stuff which breaks the symmetry. Now, if you look at the bosonic degrees of freedom, the bosonic degrees of freedom, all of them preserve the space time SO4. So there's an entropy in them, which is actually four over six. Again, this is the number of bosonic degrees of freedom. And this is what's happening in the Cardi formula. So four over six of the entropy, I'm, I'm, looking, I'm talking about numbers under the square root, comes from purely torus in, in, in fluctuation inside the torus, which don't care about space, which have perfect spherical symmetry. But then there are some fermions. And the fermions actually have a non-trivial R charge. And when you have a fermion condensate, you get some non-trivial R charge. So you get, um, and one of those, so half the fermions, so two fermions degrees of freedom still preserve the SO4. So you get five over six of the entropy coming from purely spherically symmetric configurations. And the two remaining fermions degrees of freedom break the SO4 and you get one sixth of the entropy coming from stuff which is purely space time and nothing in the torus. This seems to be the budget. Most of the entropy, again, most of the entropy carriers correspond to stuff which has, which preserves the SO4 and some of it breaks it. That's has been, uh, this is the expectation. And you know, this matches was something which we found back in 2014. Uh, again, intuitively things seem to be falling in the right, in, in, in the right, the puzzle pieces seem to be falling in the right, in, in the right, in the right position. So the question is how the solution look like, you know, okay, we haven't built it, but you know, the question is how can I expect it to look like? Well, first of all, it's a two, if you look at two char solutions, again, D2 and D4 with this ugly, with this ugly profile, 
you can actually find the equations which are giving it. And the equations are given by uh, the, the whole solution supersymmetric is parameterized by a single function satisfying some Mon Jamper equation. Mon Jamper equations are, are second order, or actually fourth order nonlinear. It's, it's, so it's, it's a nonlinear, it's a nonlinear um, system. When you have, instead of having a T4 solution, so normally you have stuff happening inside the torus. Normally you have all these little strings. They're all inside the torus. But if you put them on, you, if you smear them on three, three of the torus directions, so if you, you can keep some information of the solution by smearing on three of the torus directions, then the solutions become a string web, and which has singular brain sources, but the solution has been actually analyzed in detail by Lunin back in 2007. And you can actually show that the string webs, which again, correspond to some smeared version, but you know, some smeared without, without too much information loss, some, some smeared version of this, of this, of the super maze corresponds to a string web. And there's a singular solution, uh, which has again, these brain sources for the, of, of, of the super maze. If you want to look at the three chart solution, which is again, for example, D2 in the direction Y1, uh, D4 in the direction Y234 and momentum along Y, it will be cohomogeneity four. We don't have yet the system of equations satisfied, controlling it. I, we think it's out there. It may be some gauge supergravity, uh, which uh, Wartin has been doing. So Thomas has been visiting us in Saclay and you know, trying to figure out maybe it's some, it's some 5D ugly gauge supergravity with, with hypers and so on. So we, we, we don't know yet what the, what, what the full system underlying the equations are, but we believe there'll be some equations underlying the solution and it will be at least cohomogeneity four. So, you know, it will be a complicated solution. But the point is, all the action happens inside the torus. In space time, you have perfect spherical symmetry. So you have the same spherical symmetry as the black hole horizon. You don't have any bumps. You don't have any, you know, if you think about moving around the black hole, you see a perfect spherical symmetry. You just have bumps inside the internal directions. That's, that seems to be the, that, that seems to be the feature of the solutions. Um, it has 16 supersymmetries locally. So again, that's the smoking gun of, of not having a horizon. You cannot develop a horizon when you have 60 supersymmetries locally. And moreover, you have brains wrapping some contractible cycles. So you see, if you, you see here, for example, there's some brain, 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 wrapping this compact cycle. When you have a brain wrapping a compact cycle and you back react, there's something called the geometric transition, which was discussed a long time ago, ago by, go, go, by Gopal, Kumar, and Vafa. And this geometric transition is going to give you some bubbling solutions wrapped by fluxes. So the point is, we, we think we know what's happening, at least in the two charge system, we have a good vision of what will happen. The question is, can we change, for example, the singular brain sources, which Lulin used to put some smooth bubbling sources? Can we solve the solutions? Can we show that mathematically the solution always exists, for example? That's, the, that, that's a question and you know, this is something we're, we're, we're trying to solve. But this is again, only about the two charge system. If you look at the three charge system, the expectation is that uh, you'll also have these bubbles but the bubbles will back react. And even if the solution naively, it's, you know, you have a torus, which is very small, and then you have garbage happening inside the torus. So, you know, it naively looks like everything will be very singular and subplankian and, you know, torus size and, you know, very, very oscillating. Once you, once you, look, once you turn on the back reaction, what, you can, what, what, what I believe happens is that these bubbles, which are going to be run by some fluxes, are going to be large, irrespective of how large the, the torus is. And the, the intuition is very simple. You take 100 D brains. Even if you put them, you know, you have a million D brains in, into bunches of 100. When you have 100 D brains, there's a sphere ar around them. The flux on the sphere is, a is 100. That sphere is always going to puff up to some size, which corresponds to this flux. So the size of the sphere will, will always be bigger than the Planck size. So you, even if you have a torus which is very small, once you have the D brains inside the torus, locally, there'll be some blow ups, and the geometry will actually will be large, and you'll actually have a large size on the internal directions. That's my. Um, this is this is the expectation I have. Now the question is: Okay, we we have some new microstate geometries. They differ from the black hole only by KK modes on the torus. So if you build these solutions asymptotically in R four times S one times T four, these modes, which are Kaluza-Klein modes on the torus, they'll have some exponential decay. They'll decay very fast away from the black hole horizon. If you build these solutions in in, in ADS three times S three times T four, they'll have some power of decay. And if you think about these operators from the perspective of the D only five CFT, there are some operators of dimension delta squared equals to Q5, the number of the, the charge of the D brain, which so that's a very large number, times the number of, times the mod number on this torus divided by some of the torus directions, by, by some of the torus direction squared. Now, these operators, I ask people, because again, I'm not an ADS CFT expert, but you know, there are many, I know many people who are, so I ask them what, what are these operators dual to? What are I have this D only five, I have this CFT which has these operators, what are these operators dual to? 
And the dogma I got from Skanderis, because you know Skanderis is your, the, the guy who has the ADSCFT dogma, was like these operators, because they depend on uh, Q5, when you scale things with alpha prime, so the torus has an alpha prime scaling. So if you take the 1997 decoupling limit of the Dioni 5 system, you just take Dioni 5, you, you take alpha prime goes to zero, keeping something fixed and something fixed. These operators actually do not survive in the decoupling limit. So according to according to the 95 to the 1997 dogma, ADCFT dogma, these operators don't exist in the CFT. However, uh, I have a more uh, a new theologian. This is the neos theologos. You know, this is the uh, there's a guy who has the new theology, which you know changes the dogma. So the new theology, and you know, which is basically the more modern understanding of ADCFT, is that anything asymptotic to ADS5 crosses five ADS3 crosses six times T4 must be in the CFT. And the reason is very simple. I have a solution asymptotical to, asymptotic to this. It can tunnel into another solution. This tunneling process can be described in, in the CFT. So everything should be everything should be in the CFT. So my expectation is that even if the, these ugly operators, there should be some CFT interpretation of them. But I have no idea what they are. I have I mean nobody has built them. Their dimension depends on this. So the dimension of the operator depends on the size of the torus. So it's a very strange operator. Is it supersymmetric? Is it visible at the three orbital point? Can you use the CFT to, dis to, to distinguish between the supermate solutions? I don't know. Those are questions. I'm posing them because I think there are people in the audience who can who have who, who can have some insight and you know may, maybe maybe help in the in, maybe help us to understand what's going on. It's a very confusing thing. It's the first time we bump in, 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 into into such questions. Moreover, you can ask how the generic solution look like. So I told you you have these SO4 breaking guys which have entropy. And they are spherically symmetric, so they so, so they don't break the so they so they preserve the SO4. So, sorry, so you have the torus modes which preserve the SO4, and then you have some modes which break the SO4, which become you know our good old superstrata and all these bubbling solutions and so on. What's happening is that when you combine both of them, if you combine both T4 modes and SO4 breaking modes, the entropy you get a full entropy of the system, and then you can smear on the torus. If you look at a more generic two charge microstate, this is shown by Teller and Skanderis and Kanish Schneider. If you look at a more generic two charge microstate, you want to smear on the torus, you don't lose information, and you get solutions which are torus invariant, which are all horizonless, and you know, they count the black hole entropy in the, in the two charge system with some caveats about curvature and so on. However, if you only have T4 dependent modes and you don't have any SO4 breaking modes, so if you don't have any space time modes and all the action happens purely inside the torus, when you smear on the torus, you basically get a horizon. You get a singular solution. So the horizons, so basically, if you look at only one part of the solution, so if you look at, again, half the entropy of the states, which are purely torus, tor torus fluctuating, but SO4 invariant, when you smear on the torus, you basically get singular singular solution. You, you, you get the naive the, the five solution, which is singular and has a small horizon. So the singularity of the solution and the horizon comes because you are smearing on this torus when you shouldn't. When you have um, in, the, in the three charge system, there's a similar thing. There are some breaking, some strands in the CFT, plus, plus, minus, 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 plus, and so on. There are some modes, some, some strands corresponding to, 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 to these T4 dependent strands, which are called, you know, A dot B, B dot A, and, you know, this one is called the zero, zero strand. And if you look at superstrata, the superstrata are basically solutions which are smeared on the torus. They are obtaining 60 supergravity. They are torus independent, but they can actually capture this torus dependent structure because of the presence of plus plus strands. So when you have both plus pluses and zero zeros, you can actually capture the information of the state in the bulk by smearing on the torus. But when you don't have any plus plus strands in the superstrata, you only have zero zeros. Then if you smear on the torus, you basically get you basically get a singular solution with the horizon. You get the naive black hole solution. So the punchline of this is that you only get horizons when you are smearing too much. This is one, one, thing, one thing we discussed this morning. You get the horizon in the solutions. You know, naively, it looks like you're getting a horizon, but you're only getting it because you smear too much. If you don't smear and you stay in 10 dimensions and you look at the full solutions, then you, then you, you don't get a horizon. And there's a question whether, you know, for this particular super maze, can we get a, can we, can we get a more generic solution and so on? I'm not, I mean, those are just questions which, which I, you know, does the smearing, can the smearing be done with, 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 uh, with, um, with, I mean, can you get some T for independent super maze solutions with, 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 with all the information back? I don't know. I'm confused about this. So those are the questions which, which, which um, it would be good to discuss. So the question is, how does the big generic solution look like? Again, I have the super maze, which is SO4 invariant. I have all the superstrata. You can actually combine all of them together. The key principle 
is that you must have 16 supercharges locally. And we build an object called Temelia, or Temelion, or so those are called Temelia, which are really the biggest, fattest configuration, which has the three charges of the F1 and S5P system, as well as all, all these possible dipole charges. And the point is, this object is the multi-dynamic beast, which has 16 supersymmetries locally. So whatever you build to give it a black hole entropy in string theory, it will be made, it, it will be made from, this, from this Temelia. And the key principle is that you have the global charges, again, F1 and S5 MP, and then you have some dipole charges here, 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 which are like, you know, those two guys, for example, and you see they must be equal. Those two guys, they must be equal. And those charges come as glue. You have some brain charges giving it the black hole, and you have some dipole charges which come in to reduce, to make the supersymmetry 16, so they enhance the supersymmetry locally, and they basically uh, come in into this, into this thing. And the most generic beast is given by these brain configurations with this particular, those are some angles, phi one, phi two, phi three, phi four, and their cosines and sines, and it's given by this big fat beast. So we really have a way to track solutions all the way from the DVV microstates at zero coupling to this super maze at intermediate coupling to these geometries, which I believe will be, will, will be findable at finite coupling, but, and we need to find a solution, but we think we really have for the first time in 20 years, a way to track mi microstate entropies from the microscopic string theory counting all the way back to the full, full, full back reaction. But there's one question, for example, can we do precision holography for the super maze with T4 dependent modes? Because again, in a super maze, there's an operator, which is this T4 dependent mode, which has a non-trivial VEV. This quantity is non-zero. The question is, does the DUNI5 CFT capture this? Can we capture this in the DUNI5 CFT? Can we do precision holography for these things? Is five, is five dimensions, is six dimensions of gravity enough? Do we need to do, to do, to do 10D? Um, those are all questions which, which I have. And because again, there are many people here who are interested in black hole mergers and you know, black hole experiments, um, the generic, the question is also what's happening when it's smashed to these micro to, to of this to, to of these microstates. And the point is both of them have KK modes on the internal direction. So you have one microstate of a black hole which has some KK modes on the internal direction. You have another one which has some other KK modes on the internal direction. You smash them. You have a gravitational wave. You, you have a collision. You put them together. When you bring them together, these KK modes should be K because I have one, one of these solutions has some KK modes. The other one has some other KK modes. When you bring them together, these KK modes should decay. And the, and the collision should, should emit some KK fields. Now, the point is these KK fields are very massive. And if you do, if you think about any compactification of string theory, they should decay into some standard model fields. So one question is, does a black hole merger have an electromagnetic counterpart? If you have this kind of black hole microstate, so what, what I've been trying to tell you is that most of the black hole entropy comes from the stuff which, which depends on the internal directions. All the superstrata and so on are just smeared versions, which allows us, uh, us to capture the physics, but the microscopic degrees of freedom really live on the internal directions. And the point is when you merge two of those guys together, because all of them have KK modes, when you bring them together, they have different KK modes. And then the question is, do you emit any of these KK modes? And these KK modes should actually have should, should then decay into standard model fields. You know, that's the typical expectation for any string theory compactification. And the question is, so, so there should be an, an, an electromagnetic counterpart to all the gravitational wave signals we, we see. The question is mainly for people who know black hole, black hole um, you know, and LIGO and Virgo, and, and Virgo data, are there any constraints of this thing? Are there any constraints of this electromagnetic counterpart? I know when you had the, the, the neutron star mergers, you know, those some electromagnetic, those some light, those some light signal. But when you have black holes, what are the constraints for these things? Are they going to be the same emission as when you have neutron stars merging? Maybe it's less, maybe it's more. Um, can you understand what's happening? And I think in string theory, we can actually calculate in some example, how would this work for a two charge system? So just to give you an example, and you know, I'll finish. This is my last slide and this is my last picture. If you think about one super maze, Having you know, an M5, an M2, and you know, two M5s and one M2, but the M2 has, is, is, is fractionated. And you merge it with another super maze, which is made again of two, two other M5s and a single M2, which is again fractionated. When you bring them together, again, you're bringing them together like this, orthogonal to the, to, to the blackboard. <coughs> they should become something like this, again, four M5s. And the M2s at the beginning, they just stay like this. This M2 goes like this, this M2 goes here, this M2 goes here, but then with time, they should also fractionate and you know, they should move into a more generic configuration, which lo looks like this. Again, M2, M5s with fully fractionated M2s. The question is, when you do this, do you emit any modes? Do you emit any modes which are torus dependent? 
can you show that this emission is suppressed by some strengthening mechanisms? Maybe it is, maybe it, it is not. But it's a calculation which I think one can do. And so that's why, you know, this is, this is I think, a place where one can meet someone, one can have some calculation, and then, you know, one can compare, you know, possibly with some experimental constraints on these electromagnetic counterparts of gravity wave collisions. Thank you. Do we have questions or remarks? When you say electromagnetic counterpart, you mean basically the the merger should always be paired with some uh, loss of energy into some other sector, basically. Yes, right? yeah. into these KK modes, yeah. which then, of course, you know, in nature, don't have any KK modes. They decay into other particles, into standard model particles. Yeah. But okay, it could be undetectable because it decays into. Uh, you know, into like some dark matter particles, sure. Matter particles. Oh, I see, I see, I see. So you're saying that there should be some neutrinos. neutrino. All this trap surface, all this trap surface stuff. This is this is 40 years ago stuff. This doesn't include string theory. Trap surfaces appear only because you do low dimension. Sorry. No, you don't. Approximately, you have an infinite number of KK modes. That's exactly what you have approximately. There's no, th there's no way to smear this configuration. When you smear this configuration, of course, you get a black hole and you get a trap surface. There's no way to get, there's no way to get, this is just, you know, 4 DGR. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing about, the, the, I mean, again, it's an effective field theory. If you work in the full theory, that's what you get. There's no trap surface here. You just have a 16 supercharged solution, completely smooth. You can scatter into it. Everything comes out. There's no trap surface. It's not okay. What I'm doing is, is is super symmetric for now. So you know, I don't know the full the, the, the full story. So you know, I don't. I, I I mean, Pierre knows more about about Schwarzschild microstates. But you don't get trap surfaces again. All this this is intuition based on four D gravity. If you look at all these degrees of freedom, and these degrees of freedom, for example, give you stuff which which, which is not in four D gravity. KK modes are not in four D gravity, and you get KK modes by doing this. So all the four D gravity arguments that oh you know I get the trap surface you know. If you do a 4D gravity calculation with an infinite number of degrees of freedom, sure. Then I believe that you may, and show me that you get trap surfaces there, then I believe they are, but I don't think there'll be any trap surfaces. Sorry, I'm being very. <laughs> further question. What, what, what Rami is maybe saying is that everything come out, but it can take a long time to, to come out. So, I... And then approximately it looks like a, a hole, like black. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh... But that's not trap surfaces. This is more like a QCD. That's more like a QCD. So what's it's more like Anderson localization. Yeah. <laughs> you take two objects. Yes. Mass. So if the mass is concentrated enough from the outside, you get large redshift. Mm -hmm. I hope that you yes, argue fully, against fully, it. Fully. This is what I mean by a trap surface. So in this case, Stuff for stuff, it's hard to get out, mm -hmm. particularly electromagnetic uh, stuff just because it interacts. In, so, in that, uh, what I'm I see, saying, surface, I see. Oh, um, so I guess this is I don't uh, think it's hard to get. Daniel was, can you get a redshift? I mean, is it because of the redshift is going to be large? I mean, the stuff will, I mean, if this, if, if this thing is above the horizon at some scale. Whatever comes out, even if you get a very a very massive object, it will decay into into standard model particles, which will, which will be very energetic, and they they will get out generically. So you know, even if you get you know something at you know Rh plus you know one percent, uh, if you get the, if you're at Rh, Rh plus one percent, and you, you you get a KK particle which has I don't know ten to the sixteen uh, GeV, and you know it decays into standard model stuff, I mean the standard model stuff will be will be will will, will, will get out easily, and you know it it will force something shiny and bright. So. I think it's again, it depends on where this dynamic is happening, how far away from the horizon is happening. And this, I don't know, I don't have the full solution. But the point, I think your point is make about stuff, now I understand, you know, sorry, maybe, maybe I was too fast. It's what's happening here is it's called Anderson localization. So that's the same phenomenon as incandescent matter. So incandescent matter, when you have these fractionated guys, you see, you can ask here, for example, that this M2 brain can come out very easily. You have an M2 brain, it comes here, and then it goes out. But if it doesn't come here, if it just stays like this, it's trapped, it's inside, it's blocked. So the absorption, and when you have these two systems, which are merging and forming this, the system, this, at this point, the system can still go back into this, it can still break up. But the moment when this M2 brain, for example, breaks into two bits, and this M2 brain 
breaks into two bits and this M2 brain here breaks into two bits, there's no way the system ever comes out again. Because again, you have all these degrees of freedom. It's very complicated for the system for these M2 brains to meet again. You need n one of them to, to you need n of them to be coincidence so that they form a one which, which comes out. And that's why Hawking radiation is so suppressed. And that's why you get and that's why you get this is the trap for surface version of in this brain, in, in this brain picture. But the physics, I mean yes, yeah, so to to under to, to so mentioning that horizons appear only if you smear too much. Mm -hmm. Um also in supergravity, in whatever dimensions, you also have or uh, black holes, right? So the mm -hmm. what do you mean exactly? So supergravity in various dimensions come because I have string theory in the torus. I'm ignoring I'm ignoring torus independent physics, and they get a 4D solution or a 5D solution, and then of course that solution I can build a solution there with the horizon, okay. but that solution is completely independent on basically whatever happens on the torus. So what I'm claiming is that what I'm claiming is that in, in this in the superstrata uh, story, if you look at the, all the generic configurations, they have garbage happening inside the torus, and they have stuff happening in space time, and if you don't smear, you just see torus messy stuff, and you have you see space time messy stuff. If you smear on the torus, then you get a horizon. So the superstrata, for example, when you know, we have the superstrata and we kept on, it, it, there's some limit when you, when you kill this plus plus trans in the superstrata, when it appears that you're getting a horizon. This is actually start, how we started to work on this because we had this very funny limit of superstrata. And we realized after, you know, about a year of working with the system that actually what's happening is that superstrata are already smeared. The generic configurations of the system are not smeared on the torus. They are completing, they depend on the torus, they have a huge amount of KK modes. That's the generic configuration. In some examples, when you are filthy lucky, like for superstrata, you can smear on the torus and not lose information and get a, sm a smooth solution in 6D. But that's just because of, because of luck, I think. I mean, I don't understand why. G but generically, you know, when you smear, you, sh you should not, the information should not be preserved. So the fact that 6D supergravity already gets some, some, some microstates, that's already remarkable in my opinion. But if you want to get everything, you need to go to 10. So anyway. <laughs> 